make sure it's okay. Would you please just um, say and spell your name? Wendy Knox, W-E-N-D-Y-K-N-O-X. Excellent. Okay. Um, so as a start, if you could just give me kind of a brief biographical sketch, where you grew up, where you're from, what you've done, what you're doing now. And okay. From, originally from here, born in Minneapolis and sort of was here for probably, I don't know, then I, I, went, to, um, call, I went to Grinnell. Grinnell in Iowa. in Iowa. Yeah. So was there, and then from Grinnell I went to Seattle and then went to grad school there. And then post-Seattle I got a Fulbright, so I went to Finland. I lived in Finland for a couple of years. Huh. And then uh, after that I came, I intended to go back to Seattle, but ended up back here. Okay. And uh, worked with the theater company here. For, I'm a director, and so I worked with the theater company here for a couple of years. And then uh, uh, sort of realized I was in a one director company, and I was director number two. So I went back to Finland for six months and directed at the show at the theater academy there. And then and then came back and started a company here. Mm-hmm. So I'm artistic director of Frank Theater, and I've been here for. 20 years. Uh-huh. Okay. And you're, so when you were in graduate school, that was in theater studies or, or dramaturgy? It was in or? Uh, directing. Directing. MFA okay. in directing, yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Okay. And then can you say a bit about your the company that, that is here? Well, we do, yeah. yeah. Well, our mission is two-pronged. It's uh, sort of designed to do work that challenges both the actors and the audience. Uh, meaning I'm interested in working with actors in ways that they might not, I mean, the whole system of you know, sort of typecasting that exists in film and, and theater, um, giving actors a chance to step outside that and grow some, and also challenging audiences. Um, one of the imp- probably the biggest impetus for starting the theater was uh, seeing, you know, just like going to see shows and then walking out, and you spend two hours of your life watching something, and the first thing you say is, where should we go eat, you know? Mm-hmm. I felt like we should be feeding people in other ways, so... Uh, wanting to challenge audiences, and, and um, you know, if people come out saying, "What the hell is that about?" I feel like we've done more of a job than you know, than if they came out and said, "Where should we go eat?" So, right, right. Uh, so, what's the philosophy that kind of drives the challenges that you're talking about? Um, it can be any. Um, we're artistically and politi- politically edgy. You mm-hmm. know, it's probably we. The first ten years, I was probably um, well. The, the second prong of our mission is that we. It, Everything we do deals with some sort of social, political, or cultural issue, which mm-hmm. any theater could say and should say. But you know, for us, it's, there's the wall of our uh, some of our not all of our past things. But um, <clears throat> you know, the first ten years were probably more, you know, coming out of grad school and um, you know, having lived in Europe for a bit. I kind of came back, and there's probably more of an artistic edge then, you know. But at the same time, I think I was trying to figure out, um, you know, for me, living outside the country was more uh, valuable probably in personal ways than it was in professional ways, or just sort of having your cultural blinders sort mm-hmm. of, you know, you know, when you're on a day-to-day basis living in a, in a uh, apartment building where you're with all of the foreign scholarship holders. For, you know, so there's someone from who grew up in a, you know, a, refugee camp in Zimbabwe or, uh, you know, a Soviet physicist or a Hungarian linguist, you know, and you're doing your laundry alongside those people, the conversations are very di- very different than right. what you would have here. So right. Theater traditions, though, in that part of the world are awfully, I mean, I, I'm not so sure about Finland, but Eastern Europe in general, I mean, there's more of a kind of edgy, radical right. tradition. Right, and I think that's more true in Eastern Europe. Finland tends to be, although the theater tradition is very strong, and because it's a sort of bilingual country, and Finnish is the language, Swedish ruled, Sweden ruled Finland for 600 years, and so that's kind of the language of the upper class, mm-hmm. and or was, you know, um, and theater is uh, a reason, or it was a way in which the Finnish language is kept alive, and so in every little community there's, there's theaters, which is, and there's a saying in Finnish that every Finn is either an actor or a drunk. True. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, uh, it, it, uh, so there's, the, the tradition is really strong. Um, mm-hmm. Artistically, it's pretty kind of conservative, oh, is you know? Okay. I mean, it is, because I think it is about keeping their, their cultures, their traditions in place. You know, I think it was that. You know, but it was great living there because a lot of, uh, other artists were traveling through, so hanging out with these Polish theater groups and this Italian. I mean, it was really, you know. But like I say, for me on a day-to-day basis, living there was 
you know, just realizing the bigger world that we live in uh -huh. and how your values, you know, it's so easy to become so insulated here. And so right. uh, when I came back, I didn't quite, I was really reverse culture shocked and tried to figure out what do I do now with my sort of quirky aesthetic and also this, you know, like I, I can't just go back, you know, I don't want to do the regional theater trip. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so that, that was sort of what started that also led to, um, you know, Frank and it's, I feel, you know, the downside is, you know, we're tiny, we're trying to stay alive, we don't have money to do things, we have, you know, but we do great work and we get, I mean, I feel lucky that I get to work with, I get to do the kind of work that I believe in, I get to work with people that I, you know, that I respect, that I love, and so, um, you know, so that paycheck doesn't matter so much. Right, right. So. Well, I want to come back to that, um, but let's back up for a second. That moment when you first feel that, you want to be someone who makes people walk out of the theater and, uh -huh. and not say, what do you want to eat? Yeah. Like, where does that come from in you? Like, wh how do you understand that own dimension of your own passion? Well, I think, too, maybe if there's something that, uh, you know, I didn't grow up like I wasn't a theater brat. I was a chemistry major my first two years of college and people say well how did you get to be a theater well you know I mean chemistry is about how do things work and in a way for me so is theater how do you mm -hmm. I mean how does it work internally how do you put together a group of people in a space and make something happen and also how does it work mm -hmm. in a larger cultural sense so um, I'm not quite sure I mean I think that once I started working in theater then it was sort of like the next step well if I'm doing that then why and how and it became for me a way uh, I mean I think once I realized I wasn't going to grow up and get a real job as people would always say you know say so you know once I realized that that's what I was doing then it was a matter of figuring out how do I do that and uh, you know and, and 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 it became well okay if I'm not going to do something else <laughs> with my life then how do I find a way to combine sort of like a community activism or how do you find a way to um, act on your values mm -hmm. and incorporate and again I feel like that's a luxury in this country to be able to sort of how do you incorporate your values into what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and even more luxurious in a way that you're sort of, that helps you survive right you know yeah the luxury and I think those are different steps yes. they're very hard for people right. to you know I mean there are people who who are able to sort of act on their values and plug those in in ways that are yeah. one thing and then their job you know so I yeah. I feel lucky in, and I also knew that could end at any given moment, uh -huh. you know. How has the how has the initial vision evolved over the twenty years that you've been doing that Frank has existed? Oddly enough, we have gone back to like you know revisit the mission statement every couple of years, and it's still the same, which I think is amazing. You know, I mean, and again, I think it's the way it's crafted. It's sort of it's uh, it's uh, open enough that it allows us to do, I mean, we can do Shakespeare, um, and we can do Naomi Wallace, we can do, I mean, Susan Laurie Parks, that there's, a, you know, there's a, an openness to what we say we're doing that can include all of those things, mm -hmm. and probably about how we do it, because when we work on a piece, it's really about sort of wringing out every bit of meaning we can, and also trying to place it in the world that we live in, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So if we do, we do Taming the Shrew maybe five years ago, and it's like, you know, when we do Tammy Shrew, it's not going to be your average production. Your average Shrew. And also, yeah, and it's also not interested in, like, you know, in doing theater that's, oh, we're just going to update it to, for updating sake. I mean, that's bullshit. That's mm -hmm. just like, you know, so so it's like, what does this play mean now, and why would we do it, and what are we trying to say to people? So, mm -hmm. and it's it's equally interesting applying that sort of methodology to like a Shakespeare text or a Greek text or to or to a contemporary piece, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so the vision itself hasn't changed. I think that we've gotten better at what we do and how we do it. I think we've gotten clearer about uh, clearer about how we do things and and more sort of comfortable with yeah, we're a scrappy little theater. That's what we're going to do. We don't aspire to be the Guthrie Theater, for mm -hmm. example. You know, mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. So the other dimension of that then, there's your own vision and how mm -hmm. that actually has been constant over the years. What about the conditions you've been working in? Um, mm. 20 years ago was a very different world in certain ways, but maybe not different enough in other ways. I mean, mm -hmm. but what has, I, mean, I guess one way to ask it is how, what does the world look like through the prism of your project over 20 years? I mean, what have, what have been the things that have really shifted or changed or what are the new challenges that have arisen? Um, or, or maybe the connection with your audience has changed. I, I, it's interesting, Matt, because I think all those things, um, like, in a way, things aren't so different. We're still tiny. We're still, you know, scrapping along. Uh, we're still, um, you know, and I think that some of this is by choice. And by choice of hanging on to what it is we do. We, we could have... There was a distinct moment where we did, you know, where I did two pieces that were, uh, oh, one was this horrific Finnish premiere of a piece about domestic violence. It was just, oh, God, it was it was brutal. We did that, and then this um, Heiner Mueller, the German writer, uh, we did this like an acid trip on stage. We did these, this was our season, you know, and it's like talking to our major funder, <laughs> who actually is a great guy and very well aware of the sort of, the, I mean, he's an artist as well, so... He's like, you know, Wendy, uh, you know, so probably 12 people came for the entire season. <laughs> and that did give me maybe the first thought to sort of think about, okay, now if we are going to survive, we do have to do work that people will want to see, will want to, you know. So there was an interesting shift that happened there. Um, and also it was an inter interesting, it was probably we started, uh, we started, and this is like in our second decade, we started uh, tackling more classics. We've done a lot of Brecht. We've done, a, and again, doing Shakespeare in a way that, and I think we've become well known here for doing Brecht because our productions are, have been, you know, I mean, they're, they're, we found a way to do it really well. And it fits with our mission. It fits with, you know. Um, so there was that, that, that idea of shifting and being able to incorporate classics or titles that people know, work that may be on, in one way more accessible to people you know, in terms of first, um, when they first hear about it, but we still have stuck to how we do it in Savaya. So, um, but in a lot of ways, I mean, the, the operation of the theater may not have changed that much. We've had trouble sort of um, economically um, reaching beyond a certain, I mean, I guess we're, we're slowly crawling, but getting past a certain point, mm -hmm. you know, we're still kind of a one, I mean, for a brief moment of about five or seven years, we were like a one and a half person organization, and now we're back to a one person organization, so I had an administrative assistant for a while, it was excellent, you know, and uh, hopefully that will come back, but, um, you know, because I think because of the nature of what we do, because of the edge, again, both artistic and politically, I think that some funders or some economic sources are uh, maybe scared off by us, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit. I think that that's, but it's interesting that I think, uh, you know, and or they may be sort of, uh, you know, I think that we've un been unable to access, you know, those funds. Those reasons may have changed now, you know what I mean? I mean, like... Um, watching what funding trends are, you know, when it's all about sort of interdisciplinary or it's all about multicultural or it's all about diversity or it's all, you know, and seeing those trends change. And in a way, because we're unwilling to position ourselves, I mean, I've seen so many arts organizations and artists reinvent themselves to fit those funding trends. Right, but it's always the next. It's about chasing the, next the dog, fad, right? yeah. And so it's great, you know. They survive and they do, you know. But because we're unwilling to do that, or unable, or whatever, um, um, you know, we haven't maybe grown in the way that it would be, you know, nice, nice to. Mm -hmm. But uh, although on the other hand, I mean, as an outsider, it looks like Minneapolis, St. Paul, is a really special kind of place to mm -hmm. operate. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, I mean, there's. There's a kind of vigorous left culture, for yeah. one thing, that you don't see yeah. <laughs> anywhere. Um, but there's also a kind of, uh, there's a, an intersection between politics and culture here yeah. that's really palpable. And, I mean, oh, there's cool. the, the puppet stuff and the yeah. theater stuff and music. And there's, yeah. you know, so, I mean, maybe has that, is that 
as robust now as it ever was, or how has that there's changed? There's an ebb and flow to it. I, I found an interesting sort of um, relationship between what seemed to be going on in Seattle, at least for a period like maybe uh, during the 90s or late 90s or something, too. There was, an, there was a lot of trafficking between Seattle and Minneapolis. And so there was periods where... Yeah, because I kept thinking, am I going to go back to Seattle? And uh, now I'm not. i got a ball and chain theater company. So, uh, but, um, you know, sometimes theater was uh, in, in Seattle seemed to be more interesting and more adventurous and more. And then it would settle down and get very complacent, and then it would pick up here. And mm-hmm. I think that there's – I think that this is a pretty uh, – I mean, I do think Minneapolis is, um, you know, there is – there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, both culturally, politically, there is, you know, the again, the funding, you know, we're, we're lucky to have the foundations that we have here that provide a basis for us to do our stuff, you know, and support. I mean, having foundations that understand, you know, they understand what it is for a theater that is doing art for art's sake or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just like, okay, they're going to do that play and they're not going to make a lot of money, but we believe what they're doing, you know, and that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, so... So it is, and, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of it. I mean, there's so much, and it's been interesting to see over the years the the explosion of theaters. They'll be like, ah, oh, there's 20 new theaters this year, and then three years later, you know, well, there's three or four of those are surviving, which is, I think, like a natural part of the, mm-hmm. you know, and and I think that, um, I mean, I was well aware of that even when we started Frank. There was another theater that had been around here that did a lot of new work, and they were just kind of dying, and then Frank was sort of going. And uh, there was also, the, uh, I don't know if you know, At the Foot of the Mountain, which was sort of one of the longest, it was a women's theater company. It was one of the first, I don't know if it was one of the first. I think it was the first sort of feminist or women's theater company that had their own space in the country. And they, they existed for quite a while. And then they, they kind of, you know, fell apart. And then people say, Frank, are you the new At the Foot of the Mountain? It's like, well, no, we're not. But we're, you know, but we did pick up from both of these two theaters that were sort of fading off as we were, you know. And I think being aware of what our shelf life is or paying attention to when is it, are we done? Do we have anything more to say? Do we have more work to do? Is a, mm-hmm. a, a, an important thing to be aware of as an artist and as an organization, you know. And we're, we still have stuff to say, which is great. You know, yeah. we, we just had our 20-year t- anniversary this last season. So uh-huh. um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, you are. I mean, it's really interesting, though. I mean, I'm looking. I'm going to take a picture of these, but the posters on the wall, um, the one that jumps out is the Cradle Will Rock. I mean, when you're putting on a production like that, how do you understand your own relationship to the idea of a tradition of political, cultural production I mean, is there something there that you feel that you need to be faithful to or that you're a part of? Or is it just another kind of opportunity for expression? No, I think, I mean, I think, Matt, I do think we do have an aware. Like, that piece was interesting. Not all of our work has the opportunity for the number of sort of historic... um, parallels or intersections that that one had. That piece we did um, at the Sears building, I don't know if you've driven along Lake Street, Mm -hmm. you you know there's that big huge Sears building, it says Midtown now, Uh, do you know what it is? Yeah, I do, I passed it a few times today. Yeah, that sat there eight years empty in the middle of this sort of inner city neighborhood, it was just a big chunk old blight, (laughs) you know. Mm -hmm. There were three, three or four development efforts trying to do something with that property. But because it's such a large piece of real, it's the second largest piece of real estate in the, in the um, state of Minnesota, second to the Mall of America. <laughs> wow. And, um, you know, it had, they had closed the store and it sat there, you know, and it's, you know, it's a poor neighborhood around there. And, and I live about, you know, a mile from there. So, and I don't know what, uh, I just had a crack headed idea one morning and I just, we were going to be doing this. Cradle of Rock, and we had this other space that was kind of booked, and there were some problems coming up with the landlord that were just kind of like, you know, it's just going to be a pain in the ass. And I just went, you know, I don't know. And I don't know where it came from, but I, I, the next morning I just got up and I called my city councilman and said, hey, Gary, Frank Theater wants to do Cradle of Rock at the Sears building. Can we do that? And he just burst out laughing. He said, well, you know, the city owns that building right now, and I think that makes me part landlord, so let me get back to you. So he called the what was then the Minneapolis Community Development Association and asked them, and they kind of had the same, they just thought it was such an audacious, like, what? And um, 
you know, just by um, persevering, we and they gave us the keys to this building. <laughs> I mean, I, I still don't know why or how. I mean, they just said here, and we had this whole big building, you know. And we, I mean, we figured out where we were going to do it. Um, you know, we, we wandered, but it was fascinating. I mean, just wandering around this, it was the largest catalog shipping center, I think, west of the Mississippi at one point, and, and just, and and this neighborhood, um, I had just bought a house not long before that, over, not far from there, in the same neighborhood, and there was all these old timers that were still in the neighborhood then, they were just kind of starting to die off or move into nursing homes, stuff like that. but so many of them, like, raised their families working at Sears, and I mean, and so many people talk about, oh, I bought my first air conditioner there, I mean, the, the you know, it was just, it's interesting what that did for so long, and then it was gone, mm-hmm. and um, and it was fenced in, and these, you know, so when we went in there and we, we did the play, um, there was also an interesting, um, it was an interesting time in Minneapolis, there was like three strikes going on, the Metro uh, bus workers were, the, were on strike, there was a strike at the university, I think, and I think the state, I think AFSCME was going, so, um, so there was a, you know, in terms of thinking about being faithful to a particular tradition with that, we weren't so much, we're really interested in the history. And every Frank Theater project becomes like a giant research project. Mm-hmm. And I managed to draw in actors and attract actors and hang on to actors that really do want to think about stuff. So they really, I mean, you know, we'll have a, we'll have the rehearsal table lined up and there'll be piles of books and Peter has been on our board and has helped us out a lot where he'll come in. And the, the actors are really interested, you know, and not all actors are, but the Frank actors are really just kind of, there is an element of activism in them and also that they're smart folks and so they want to find, you know. So um, with all the labor issues that were going on at that time, it was really, it made that piece particularly potent with the fact that we were in this building. Uh, you know, we put these huge posters up outside, you know, and the little neighbor kids would be biking around. They're like, is that a movie in there? Is that a movie? And they'd come up, we'd get them to usher, you know. He's like, hey, can I see the plan? And I'm well, I don't know. So, would your mom know where you are? Go home, bike over, tell your mom, tell her you're going to hand out programs. You know, we just give them, you can hand out programs, but tell your mom you'll be home by 8 10, you know. And so they would, they, it was really a, a great, it was really fun. And then the, the show happened to be, uh, it, was a, it was a great show, and it really did strike a chord with uh-huh. our audience. And did, and did it get a different kind of audience than some of your other... Sort of. I, I, that, that's one of the, the challenges, too, with Frank, is that we do, you know, trying to figure out who our audience is, is a perpetual, you know, head-scratcher. Uh, because because we're transient, we mm-hmm. performed... And that was the... No, that was the second piece. The first piece we did in an old warehouse was over... Um, we did uh, The res- res- Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui over at... Uh, an old ammunition factory near where Peter and Beth live over hmm. in St. Paul. And um, that was our first kind of rough space. We performed in just about every theater venue in town. Um, but then we started going, hey, look at those warehouses. How can and, and it's great fun to sort of, there's two things. One, it's great fun to be able to just sort of have this, you know, blank canvas and figure out where are we going to put, you know. It makes everything five times more difficult, but also... Um, Finding buildings that have some uh, interesting historical or social significance is, is, that sometimes lines up with the play that we're doing and sometimes not. But being able to, the, to see what happens to the neighborhood around it, mm-hmm. that it just kind of energizes people like, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. You know? We did um, over on the, the Pillsbury... A mill. It's a flour mill. It's on the other side of the river. Is it the original? I mean, it's, does it go way back? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really cool. And... Um, we did four productions in the machine shop that is attached to the flour mill, uh, it, which is just this huge old building, and it's got, um, you know, it's got this boom crane that runs the whole length of the building with this giant. Ho- I mean, there's all this stuff that you know, and we were um, rehearsing in there one day, and we had there's a couple of garage doors at the front. We had thrown open the garage doors, and it was a, like lovely fall afternoon. And I was looking, there's this guy standing in the doorway. He's kind of silhouetted. And I go over there, and he's got a cane. He's an old-timer. And he comes in. He says, I used to work here before the war. You know, and he just started crying. 
He showed us where his station was and what he did, and you know, and being able to bring the people in from around that, it seems that I mean, there's two things: one, we sort of bring a life to the building, and also being able to bring people into the building, and mm-hmm. you know, that's really exciting. It doesn't happen, you know, with not every venue that we're in does it work that way, but it's there's there's something like that. So. Uh-huh. It seems especially poignant right now because I know that. You know, since the real crisis hit in 2008, and it doesn't, driving around, it doesn't seem as bad here as other places I've been. But one of the major public markers of widespread distress is the amount of vacant, yeah. especially retail, but, yeah. but commercial office retail space. And it's just stunning. The, yeah. the numbers of, of space available signs. You I think see. it is bad here. I mean, it might not be as bad as other places, but like, I mean, downtown, the vacancy stuff, it's like looking at these build, huge buildings that aren't, aren't that old, and they're just, you know, whole floors empty, and uh, housing-wise, too, it's, I mean, they're, I think Minneapolis is really high, or was. North Minneapolis, I think, is one of the higher, have you been up in North Minneapolis, though? I don't think so. It's an interesting neighborhood, it's, it was, um, it used to be, uh, it was a Jewish neighborhood for a long time, and then now it's sort of become African American. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, people drive through Minneapolis and they, oh, there's no, there's no slums in Minneapolis. <laughs> you can hear people say, and they're kind of walled off. I mean, in North Minneapolis is really an eye opening and heartbreaking, you know, um, sort of little cruise because you see these houses. What are the streets? It's like if you went up. Um, if you're on 94, for example, if you're taking 94 West, I can write it down for you if you want. And if you go off like on Dowling Avenue and then just sort of drive south into downtown on any of this, I'm, you know, I'm it's just right. like, you know. Or you could also go um, over, do you know where the Walker Art Center, have you been by that at all? Mm-hmm. So kind of head up in lindale If you went there and just sort of drove north, north. you can see. It's just, it's, um, you know, there's p- pockets that are vibrant, but... You know, you'll see like almost whole blocks that are boarded up, and you know, uh-huh. between the foreclosure closure stuff and between sort of you know, dealing and stuff like that. It's just, it's just kind of breaks your heart. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, how much has? Uh, well, I guess I mean there are two questions. One is, um, what are the other ways that one feels the kind of dailiness of crisis, um, or you know, since two thousand eight or or so. Um, and the other is in your own business. I mean, how much has it affected the kinds of decisions that you've made or the kind of challenges that you face? We had our first deficit in 20 years uh, last year. Of, you know, and our budget is tiny. It's like $150,000, and we had about a $20,000 deficit, so that hurt. Um, and that, um, you know, affects... We had enough of a cash reserve to sort of absorb that, but... Uh, as one of my board members said, well, we can maybe do that one more time and then the party's over, you know. Um, and so that's making this year very tough. Um, a choice that we made was uh, last fall we did a piece called Palace of the End by a Canadian writer, Judith Thompson, which is essentially three monologues. Um, it's all it's about Iraq. And uh, the first monologue is modeled by or inspired by or ripped off from the Lindy England story. You know, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So it's a young woman. I mean, it's, and it's in her voice. Yeah, yeah. It's very, you know, and she's talking about those. I mean, it's very clearly her. The second one is um, based on David Kelly, who was a, a British microbiologist and a weapons inspector. And he's the one who blew the lid off the whole WMD thing. And then he was a source for the British, British press. And then he outed himself you know, as the source when the reporter was going to go to jail, and then he subsequently committed suicide. And the third monologue is um, an Iraqi woman. I guess she's, it's based on a real Iraqi woman. We couldn't find much about her, but that she was um, bombed by the Americans in the first Gulf War. Um, so she's talking about life under um, Saddam Hussein. Um, so three little monologues. A lot of our stuff, a lot of our work tends to be big, epic, sort of, you know, huge casts. I'm kind of like, you know, friends of mine look at me who comes in and like, Knox, what are you doing here? Everyone else is like dying and they're doing two and three person shows and you're doing a whole Trojan War thing with a cast of 20 and an original score and, you know, in a warehouse, you know. And it's kind of like that never say die thing. But in this, this one, we, it was a small enough piece 
it was very intimate with the three things. So we actually did it here. Mm -hmm. We have these um, this uh, pink insulation stuff that we actually built to plug the windows and painted it and sculpted it so it looked like the brick wall. It looked like it was a solid brick wall across mm -hmm. there. And it was just three. We had three things here. And we had a 50 seat theater. We we put risers in the chairs, and so, I mean, uh, which was a way of. It worked very well for that piece because it was so intimate. For us, it was an economic thing too because we're we, this is our rehearsal studio. We're here anyway. We're having to pay rent on this place anyway. If we can do it here, let. And it was a great. I mean, so, that was one. Mm -hmm. clear thing that we sort of did um, it you know the whole economic thing is affecting you know uh, as much as I don't want it to or refuse to let it dictate artistic choices it's it is you know I mean if we're gonna survive we're having to sort mm -hmm. of hunker down quite a bit mm -hmm. um, you know and again I tend to be pretty uh, irreverent and um, uh, what the fuck let's just do you know Let's do another break. Like we don't get, you know, and, you know, and I, 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 I'm having to temper myself with that right now, which is a little, you know. But it's, you know, I want to believe we'll get through this, and I want to believe mm -hmm. that we're going to survive, you know. And I, and I, and I feel like we will. But, um, you know, it's it, you can feel a constriction, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think you can, I mean, I feel that even more broadly around just even around, you know. Friends of mine, the number of people that really are out of work, and not just that are numbers that you read about, but people that you know mm -hmm. who, you know. I mean, I was in a thing yesterday. It was a training workshop offered by the Arts Council. There were 17 people sitting around the table, I think, and two of them were, had said that they had just, that they had lost their job. They had just lost their jobs fairly recently, you know. So, and, you know, there, and it's people, I mean, the numbers, then that's I know that's a low percentage, but still it's just it's, it's you know if you're one of those people it's yeah. a very high percentage. Yeah, and it's I and I do think it's like feeling it differently than than I've ever seen. You know, I mean the weight of what's going on now, you know, whether it's just that I'm old enough to comprehend that, which could be. Uh you know, mm -hmm. but it just it does feel that it's a you know, it's a it's a it's a rough time. Yeah. So looking out from the theater to the city to the nation, uh -huh. you know, what, what have, how would you characterize your experience of the last... Well, let me ask the question this way. When I use the phrase, our current moment, it seems to be a very powerful one for people, mm -hmm. although people attach different meanings to it. Yeah. But it's, people do, in general, have a sense that this is a kind of extraordinary moment yeah. we're in, whether they're defining it as the post-9-11 moment, right. the post-crash moment, right. the Obama, whatever. Right. But what's, what's your sense of um, kind of the outlook for the nation and, and how you've experienced these extraordinary times? Well, I do think it is extraordinary. And I do think there is it. I do think, for me, the Obama thing is something... I had this great exchange about a week ago. I was over at the Y. I'd been swimming, and I was sitting in the hot tub, and there was... To, there was an old guy, an old white guy, a young mixed race woman, and a probably middle aged um, African American woman who was just, uh, and the, the, the women were talking about um, hair, you know, about knowing how to do your kids' hair, and, and you know, uh, and or I think something had happened. I think there had been a white, the, the young woman had, uh, who was mixed race, had, um, had her hair braided, and I think maybe someone had just left the hot tub that had asked something about there, or someone had gotten upset about it. These women were not upset, but they're like, what was she all? Um, so that, this conversation started, and I was sitting there, and I was listening, I couldn't help, I just I had to join in with them too. And so then we were talking about, and it was just, a, it was great to be talking with this, you know. Um, and uh, then somehow, you know, we were gabbing about this or that, and somehow it got to Obama, you know. And it was just, it was so great to he hear this. I mean, the woman had to be in her, she was probably 50s, early 50s, maybe more, but just say, I just, I never thought I would see it. I, ne you know, you know, and, and same thing with the younger mixed race. They were just like, you know, and we were all like, who, uh, who would have thought? It's like, if you were thinking Hillary or Obama, who do you think, you know? And I mean, I think that there is still a glow about that, and there still is just something about. I mean, I, that how 
incredible that is mm -hmm. that um, something you didn't think really would happen in your lifetime or wondered if it would did happen you know and um, and I do think that that sense of euphoria and hope that I think still uh, I think still think it hangs there but then you know then you know it's crap you know you get all this you know and it you know, I mean, you want, I mean, with all the messes that are going on, and of course, then the whole thing about who wants to blame who, and that sort of, that kind of bullshit of throwing stuff back and forth, which is just really kind of muddying the waters and not getting anything done, and all, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, seems to be hampering any kind of movement, you know. Right. I guess, well, so, when you think about the first year of his administration, which, which thing for you takes more luster off of it? Is it, is it decisions that he's made, or is it things that you see in the opposition, or is it just the whole compound? I mean, no, it's things in the opposition because I also think you know. I mean, I just think that being president in this country is a you know it's what a job. You know, you can't win, and who would want that job? You know, I mean, getting anything done. And also, I just know, too, is that even when you're leading any kind of group, whether it's a group of, you know, 15 artists or a classroom of, you know, 35 students or, you know, what, and imagine trying to lead a nation. <laughs> 300 million, no thank you. You know, exactly. It's just like, you know, and, and um, you know, and getting things done and changing things takes time, you know. And, you know, I mean, again, I, and I think he's made some big, bold, you know, moves and um, some of them may or may not, not pay out, but we don't know that. I don't think we're going to know that. And I guess, again, I'm, I'm far more uh, willing <laughs> to extend that time to him mm -hmm. than I would particularly after the eight years of the previous, you know, stuff. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, I don't, I also think it's just... Um, I just think it's interesting with what our political system is, too, that I don't know how the guy can win, you know? Well, we've almost become ungovernable. Yeah, yeah. And it's getting more so. It is like, I mean, the way that the Congress is right now, it's just like, I mean, what a bunch of assholes, <laughs> you know? And they're all just, I mean, I, 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 as much as I say I, do, I don't fault Obama for this, but then there's some Democratic Congress people that I'm just like, what the fuck, you know? So it's 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 very interesting because it to see how the whole country has moved to the right, you know, in the past whatever twenty five years or so. I mean, I just, I mean, I remember going when I was living in Finland, going to uh, London for Christmas, and I was with a bunch of friends of mine. Uh, I was with some friends of mine, and we were friends of theirs. They didn't know me from Adam, whatever. And this is this is Reagan era, you know. So this is like, and they found out that Yank. It was just like, oh, they were on me about, you know you know, planting cruise missiles in Europe. And it's just like, would you have a conversation with me first? <laughs> you know, but it's just like, because you're American. Right, you did you know, this. You, you yeah, yeah, you're, you're responsible. Your yeah, you know, and, but it's interesting to think about what, you know, what the country was then and how it is. I mean, and this is just really sort of how the country has changed, even in my adulthood, you know, how it's everything has moved, you know, has crept to the right. So even people who are like what would have been centrist then now are like flaming commies, you know? <laughs> right, like Obama. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's, just, and it's just a, bunch of, a bunch of bullshit. You know, it's like you look at what he's saying, it's just like, so that's that's very frustrating, you know? Mm -hmm. you know. And then this whole this lunatic fringe we've got going on now is, mm -hmm. and our governor here <laughs> who just cut, you know, health care for the poor. He just cut out the general, uh, the general assistance, medical care, you know, stuff for, you know. And he's going to have his mug on Meet the Press this Sunday. So. Right, and he's <laughs> going to make a run for the presidency. Yeah, exactly. And that's what he's doing. So he's completely abandoned this stuff. He's gone to sort of try and balance the, after, after trashing Obama's sort of, you know, stimulus stuff, he took a big chunk of that money to balance the state budget. And then... Um, and then also to further balance it, he, he did all these cuts across most uh, most departments. It was about 6%. For the arts, he took like 35%. He wants to get rid of the Minnesota State Arts Board and have it become a nonprofit corporation. You know, he's just an asshole. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Is the Tea Party movement visible here? I think 
it is a bit again. I don't traffic in those circles, Matt. Uh, <laughs> that does not surprise but, me. But, uh, but I thought know, you might notice them when you saw right. them. No, you know they do. There have been these um, rallies at the Capitol. I know there was something. Was it the Roe v. Wade anniversary or something that was not too long? I think they were. They're having a. Did they? Wasn't there a national sort of Tea Party Day where they were all parading around? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were. So they came out here yeah, for they that. They came but. out here for that too. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, and you know, I think Poet is part of that. I don't, you know, I, he, you know, he's not as lunatic as like Palin and stuff like that. But his tone has changed sharply in the last couple of years. You know, he's a Republican. He always has been a Republican, but he sort of uh, voiced. He he did function. Mm, I don't know if this is true, and I might be telling a lie, but I mean, seemed to be fairly moderate in what he was doing for a good part of. But now he's just come out as a flaming, you know, mm-hmm. just, so. Uh, What's the general verdict on Jesse Ventura at this point? I think everybody, I, if, you know, he's a nutball. And I love that Minnesota has this history of just, you know, electing these nutballs for, like, governors. It's just, you know, um, you know, I think that that's, I think that's kind of what it is, you know, that he was just, he was kind of a nutball, but I think that some of the things, I mean, he's just interesting as a politician, where some of the things that he did, did end up having, you know, a good effect. Well, and, I was wondering if there's, a, if there's a kind of recognizable Ventura legacy in Minnesota politics or policy. I don't know. That's a good question to ask Peter, actually, too. But, um... You know, I mean, I think it's interesting looking at what he, what, uh, I mean, how people view, view him. You know, c- because he still does, he's just, you know, just he's insane. I mean, he's just a freak, you know. But, you know, and I mean, I, I, I don't think the guy's terribly smart, um, you know, but I think he did, it's, it's interesting to see that some of the things that he did that were so ridiculous and people remember those things, but then some of the things that he did, you know, whether it was the people around him or what, that he, he doesn't have a legacy that's quite as lunatic as I would have thought, you know. I think, he's, I think people think about him as an approach with caution, mm-hmm. you know. You know, but, you know, I'm trying to think to who he was running against when I think it was, because I, I, it was just kind of funny. That, I mean, it was just a, amazing that he won, you know. But that's, again, I'm wondering about our whole political system and what it takes to win, you know, and what do you have to do and what will people vote for, you know, because I don't think people are thinking about that so much, a lot of people, you mm-hmm. know. And I think mm-hmm. in Jesse Ventura's it was his, his charismatic and his sort of celebrity, you know. That'll go a long way. What a nutball, yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to your own work. Um, during the Bush years, were those, I mean... One might imagine that those were kind of boon years for an edgy, left-of-center theater group in Minneapolis. I mean, did you find that there was a certain energy for the kind of work you were doing because of how wretched the world had become? I think think for certain pieces, yeah. I think that we did this piece called The Love Song of J. Robert Oppenheimer, which was about... It was sort of an imagined conversation between... um, uh, Oppenheimer and uh, Lilith as a figure of you know Hebrew mythology. So, uh, and um, she being a figure who was cast out, and he being someone who was also cast out of the scientific community. So, it was an, a very interesting piece, and just about the whole sort of development of the bomb. And was it fueled? Was it truly fueled by um, intellectual curiosity and sort of scientific exploration, or was it fueled by rage at what was going on in Europe at the time? You know. Uh, very smart, you know, interesting piece, and we did it just as we were getting ready to go to war, and uh, and it kind of, again, kind of electrified audiences. We had just um, we do after uh, on s- we do Sunday matinees, and after every matinee, we have a a post show discussion where we it's not about you know how did you like the play. Uh, it's about, we invite members of the community to come in who have some experience with or perspective on some aspect of the subject matter of the piece. Like mm-hmm. we had um, uh, the guy who who was the curator of the uh, Los Alamos Museum 
he was here. We had someone from the university who had worked because Oppenheimer's brother was here for a while. We had, you know, we bring in different people and then have a conversation with the audience to try and, you know, sort of wrestle with the ideas that are raised in the play. And I'm not so interested in the sort of artistic, what did we do with it, but what does the play provoke in you that you want to talk about? And, um, you know, usually you say, okay, we're having a post show discussion how to play, and you can see people just flee as I would flee for the door. Get me out of here. Yeah. But I remember one of our one of our first ones or something, too, we, we sort of said there's one person left. I mean, there's an audience that was a small theater, probably 70 or 80 people. Only one person left. Everybody else just stayed in their seat. And I think the play had an impact, but they also really wanted to talk about stuff. So there's a few pieces in that time that... Um, you know, Cradle was another one that, again, sort of fired people up. What year were you doing that? That was 2003. Mm-hmm. When did we do Oppenheimer? There's not a year on that. that well, that was like 2003, too, because we had our year. And then we did... Um, uh, I'm trying to, another one, uh, The God of Hell, which is a Sam Shepard screed. It's excellent. He's just pissed off at the whole... It's a, it's a, it's a, it really is just a rant against the whole Bush administration. It's excellent, you know. And that one also, people just loved it. They ate it up. You know? And again, we have kind of an audience that is sort of made up of academics. I mean, it's not a normal theater going on. It's just not the Guthrie crowd, you know. It's like it's people. I mean, there's a lot of academics. There's a lot of sort of activists. There's artists, you know. So, um but that piece, and I think, again, that people were angry at that point, and so when that piece, they were just like, yeah, <laughs> you know. I'm trying to think what else we did in that. We did do, we did do um, an original adaptation thing of, uh, the, we took these two Greek plays, we called it The Women of Troy, and uh, it was a big anti-war thing, too. Mm-hmm. So, and that... Wasn't that done kind of nationally? Was the, um, and the, you know, that was Lys- the Lysistrata project. Oh, that's right, 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 right. And we also participated in that, too. We did mm-hmm. do that. So um, I did that play probably about 10, 12 years ago at the Guthrie Lab in their space. But, but um, that thing was kind of cool. We did the Lysistrata project. That was right when we were doing Oppenheimer. So we were a hot potato at that point. I mean, it, was, it was great because there was a lot of stuff going on. People were coming. It was... It was and it was fun because people were fired up mm-hmm. and um, and had something to be, you know, to focus it on, which I think is another difference when you see when there is something that everybody can, or not everybody, but a number of people, uh, the critical mass can get behind, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the Women of Troy was in 2005, and that's one that we did also in that old, that Pillsbury Emil. Uh, and it was just a big sprawling mess of a play but it was great it was angry and I mean it took Trojan women and Hecuba these two and we just kind of smashed them together and then had kind of a blues based um, score for it and uh, and that was that had a good response to it. and again I think people are looking for a, an outlet in that way so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah in some ways yes we did have some you know I'm trying to think what else we did during Three Penny, yeah, Three Penny was in the early 90s, it was like 99, and that one had a good, that had a good um, sort of bite to it, to the whole, but, uh, so yeah, we had a good target then, <laughs> you know, but trading the target for Obama. Uh, well, I know, I know, priceless. <laughs> I'll, 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 yeah, right. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your generosity. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you feel that we should have? I don't think so. I don't even know. What are you doing with this? Are you going to do? Is it like a? Well, do you know? Yes. Um, Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh.